unfortunately in Malaysia, you can arrest anyone for disturbing the public peace. She looked at us and she said, how did they exactly do this? And the policeman said, I can show you. Now you saw in the film, there were police, police women with the videos, they were filming us. So he turned to his computer and he says, I can show you. What did she see? She saw about 130 women praying beautifully. We sing so nicely together. Out of the sidur, and some men standing and screaming over the partition, and some women inside the women's section with obscenities, also Orthodox women, with obscenities on, a, on an umbrella or on their back. And she said to him, you know, it looks to me as if it's the, uh, it's they, them who are disturbing the public peace, not the women. Police officer looked at her and said, yes, but it's because of the women. And she screamed at him and she said, that's like accusing a woman of her own race. And she sent us home. So we were very happy and we went home, but the police decided to appeal to a higher court. Now this time it was really serious. We took a criminal lawyer. And this time they decided to appeal under another law. Um, when Women of the Wall started 27 years ago, the government of Israel um, added a small uh, addition to the law of the Holy Place, which is still true. Anyone who prays at the Western Wall not according to the custom of the, of the place, and in a way that could offend the feelings of others, can be put in prison for up to six months, or paid a fine. I have no idea how much the fine would be, because we would never have paid it. So this time, it was serious, and we had to take a criminal lawyer, and I said goodbye to the family, you know, because we would have gone to prison. We wouldn't have paid the fine. And this time it was a, a man, judge, an ultra orthodox, a modern orthodox man called uh, Moshe Fogel. And he came back with a precedent setting verdict that is studied now at the universities in Israel. Because what he said is very long verdict, but the bottom line was firstly, he described that the custom of the place is the custom of Rabbi Rabinovich and the ultra orthodox. Women of the wall have been there then for 24 years, and they are also the custom of the place. That's number one. Number two, the government of Israel never fulfilled its part in the Supreme Court ruling. They never really prepared the southern part of the plaza, Rosenbrief Art, in a way that, that is at all acceptable for prayer. It doesn't feel holy. There's, there's nothing there. It's, it's uh, uh, archaeological, an archaeological dig with, with a small podium that we were supposed to stand on and pray. And so, the month after that, the police, instead of arresting us, were protecting us. And we needed protection because the masses of ultra-Orthodox that came to fight us, I mean, you saw those guys with the whistles. You can imagine hundreds and hundreds of them. It, it was really, really difficult. But two, three months went by and all calmed down, and we could start praying freely. But we couldn't bring in the Torah to pray. Remember? The guards at the entrance wouldn't let us bring it in. So it was a catch-22. By law, we could read it because judge, the judge said that we could read the Torah scroll, the four keys, all four of them. But we couldn't bring it in. We, there was no way to bring it in, so every time I would have to think of a way to smuggle it in. One night, I sat, sat there the whole night. I went in in the evening beforehand when they weren't expecting me, dressed as an ultra-Orthodox woman with a wig and long sleeves and everything. And I sat there the whole night with a with with the Torah scroll. So, so the situation now was was a very strange situation. No arrest, but we couldn't bring in the Torah scroll. At the same time, North American Jewry was getting more and more involved and more and more active and more and more upset at what was happening in Israel. And the ambassador to the United States, the Israeli ambassador, Michael Oren, 
came to Netanyahu, went to the Prime Minister and said, listen, you've got a problem. The, Jew, the, the North American Jews are getting very, very upset. You're losing them. <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, over women of the West. And I said, over who? What? Why? He wasn't aware that there was such feelings here. And, and you know, every time anyone came from Israel to speak at any event, People in the audience would get up and say, what is this story you're telling us? They're not your West Kingdom. They're praying the way we pray in our synagogue. This is unacceptable to us. So Netanyahu uh, sent uh, the head of the Jewish Agency to talk to the head of the Reform Co Movement, the Conservative Movement, and the Federation here in North America. And he offered them the southern part of the, of the, of the Western world. And so we went into a, a, a mode of negotiations. We sat for three years at a table with the government of Israel, the representative of the government of Israel. You know, this is, this is huge. They sat and they talked to us for the first time. And not only to us, but to the Reform and Conservative Movement and the Federation. Uh, we were all at, the, at this table, mm -hmm. this negotiating table. Now, there were two tables. There is our table, but there was another virtual table. And in this virtual table was the rabbi in charge of the wall, the chief rabbis of Israel, the ultra-Orthodox party were all sitting there, but it was virtual. Because firstly, they wouldn't sit with us. And secondly, there wasn't really a table, but every time we would reach some kind of agreement, the representative of the government Abichai Mendelblit, who was the, uh, the uh, um, secretary to the government, would go to that virtual table, get their agreement, and come back to us and veto and say, this yes, this no. So the final agreement was to many, in a many in, in strong way, a compromise. But it was a compromise that we were willing to make for, for the unity of, of Am Yisrael and for the possibility of having a pluralistic plaza at the Western Wall. Now, again, you've got to understand why this is so meaningful, because the Western Wall, for all of us, you know, it's, it's the mecca of the Jewish people. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the place that is holy to all of us, to any, any Jew, anywhere. And so any battle there and any change there influences so many other realms, whether it's the recognition of the, the liberal movements in Israel, whether it's civil marriage and divorce, all those issues are going to be influenced by any kind of agreement and any kind of compromise at the Western Wall. Not to talk about the whole issue of gender equality, which is also very much part of this battle. So here, here we have a, a, an agreement with three main topics. The first issue that we agreed upon was who's going to run this new area. And for us, it was important that, for instance, that there be 40% women running it, and that there be representation for the reform movement, the conservative movement, the federation. All this we had to agree upon. And of course, Rabbi Rabinovich didn't really want it. Now, he has a body that runs the northern part of the Western Wall. How many women? Zero. How many liberal Jews? Zero. All ultra-Orthodox men. And this was something that we had to make sure wouldn't happen in our area. So that was the first subject. The second subject was funding. The, the northern part of the plaza, the western, the, the Kotel Western, the Western Wall Heritage Foundation has a budget of $20 million a year to run that area. They're building a building there now, and they have a lot of money. But we didn't want that much money, but we wanted to make sure that we have enough money to build it and to maintain it, to have toll scrolls and to have vaults to keep them in, in a way that they keep them safe and, and not the way it's kept now there. The tourist girls there now are kept in lockers like in a sports room, you know, those 
metal lockers and, and they get jammed and they get ruined. Um, so that was the second factor. When we think upon that, the third was the heart. Because we demanded visibility. It was so important that anyone who comes into the Western world will have a choice. Now, for you in North America, a choice is something that's so obvious. You can always just choose you want to go to this synagogue, and that synagogue, this way, that way. But with us, it is a resolution to be able to choose to go to an egalitarian section to, to pray men and women together, or, or, or if you want to, you go to the segregated section. And that is one of the reasons that the ultra-Orthodox are so much against it, because they don't want Israelis to have that ability to choose. Now, we believe that this new plaza will be the plaza that most Israelis will go to, and of course, anyone who comes from North America, because they want to pray together. If synagogue comes, they want to pray together. And why do we know that most Israelis will go there? Because there are a lot of bar mitzvahs in the, boy, in the men's section. And the mothers, and the grandmothers, and the aunts stand on a plastic chair to see it. And they don't really want to. They want to stand beside their sons, grandsons, nephews. They want to stand beside them. And even if they don't stand together, there won't be a mechitza. But even if they don't stand together, but they stand beside each other, they'll be there. And so most Israelis will come to our plaza. Not only that, there's a law in Israel that every student, every pupil during their 12 years of school is brought by the school, and it's paid by the Ministry of Education, they're brought to the kosher. Now, when they come, when my daughter was at school, and she was taken to the kosher, to the Western Wall, who did she meet? Rabbi Rabinovich's people. And she... The, the boys, they were taken to the men's section. If they were after Bar Mitzvah, they had Tulin and they could read. And the girls, they were told to go to the wall and put a note in and, you know, just touch the, touch the stone. So many, many schools will choose to come to our plaza. Yes. The wall of the plaza, may the, way, the best plaza win. Ours would win. And that is the story. That is the main story. So, on the 31st of January this year, historic, historic moment. The government of Israel votes to adopt this agreement. Not only to adopt it, but to carry it out. Now, I can tell you, because I know that Rabbi Rabinovich agreed. He, by the way, signed off on it. But the chief rabbis agreed because we know they were at that virtual table. And we know that the also orthodox party also knew about the agreement. Okay, and they, they agreed to it. So, but what happened? The media, the ultra orthodox media went wild. They started blaming their uh, leaders give, that they gave away the wall. That they gave it to the reform and conservative women of the wall weren't even mentioned anymore. Now it was the the reform and conservative. And, um, and so the leaders, the ultra-Orthodox leaders, reneged. They said, okay, we, we never really knew about it. We never really agreed to it. And they threatened Prime Minister Netanyahu that they would leave the government. Now, if they'd leave the government, the government would fall because the political structure of our, our uh, Knesset, of our parliament, um, small parties have tremendous strength because you cannot build a coalition without them. So if they would leave, the government would fall. And Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, wanted to buy time, and so he appointed the head of his bureau. Uh, he gave him six, uh, 60 days to try and solve the problem. 220 days have passed. We haven't heard from him. I don't know if you have, but nothing has happened. And so something very exciting happened last night. Last uh, Rosh Chodesh, it's Rosh Chodesh today. It was um, at 6.30 in the morning, a group of reform and conservative rabbis from North America who are in Israel now for the Board of Government, uh, government 
governors of the Jewish agency walked with 14 Torah scrolls up from the dung gates and were going to bring in Torah scrolls for women of the wall. And after we would have our morning prayer, 7 to 8.30, they were going to have an egalitarian prayer in the plaza behind the men and women section. We didn't know what would happen. You know, I was sitting there biting my nails. I was watching it uh, live streaming, you know, on Facebook. And they walked up, and there was a siege of, of ultra-Orthodox trying to push them. And they walked in, and they brought the Torah scrolls. And for the first time since ever, there were 14 Torah scrolls in the women's section. And, and the women had their their tefillah, their prayer, and it, it was absolutely wonderful. There was a lot of um, obstruction, um, and it was very strange for me to see it, but there were men in the women's section that wanted to uh, harm, harm our women, and then our men went in to protect our women. And, and so suddenly the women's section, it was men and women, and, and then there were children with whistles, and some ultra-Orthodox women who, who blow their whistles so that we can barely hear ourselves. It's very difficult for us to, to hold our, our Mosh Chodesh prayer. But it was really exciting, and it was a very clear message to the Prime Minister. And the message was zero tolerance, no more. And he heard it loud and clear. Uh, the newspapers today in Israel are full with that, that's the headlines. If you go online, Jerusalem Post, uh, you know, uh, all, all the English-speaking uh, newspapers from Israel, and I, I believe that will also be in, in the forward and uh, the newspaper, Jewish newspapers here, those are the headlines, that the leaders of the liberal movements here have had enough. And why? Because they thought that they were bringing such a victory on the 31st of January to their constituents you know, they said, it's long last, a pluralistic plaza, we negotiated, we're bringing you something, and suddenly they left with nothing, nothing. And so they simply had enough, and they said, zero tolerance, that's it, it's finished. I, I was speaking at, a, at an event um, in Florida uh, last week, and um, there was a representative, the deputy uh, consul uh, to Florida. And one of the rabbis, there were quite a few rabbis, and he got up and he said to him, I need you to pass a message to the government of Israel. We love Israel, but the clock is ticking. You can't carry on treating us like second-hand second -hand, um, citizens or Jews or not accepting our Judaism. You know, we love Israel, but you can't treat us like this anymore. So, so the message is very, very clear, the message that's, that's going out. Now, we have a few things ahead, a few battles ahead of us. Um, one of them is going to take place um, around the corner in Hanukkah. So one of the things that Women of the Wall are doing is we're bringing back, we're bringing rituals that men perform at the Western Wall to women. One of them is mm -mm, the Karnot blessing, okay? I'm not sure where it is. This, okay? The Karnot, the blessing, the priestly blessing. Three times a year, men in the men's section have a huge priestly blessing where, where men who are descendants of Kohanim, of the priests, bless the congregation with the talit over their head and their hands like this. We know it from Spock, live long and prosper, but it comes from the priestly blessing. And women of the wall decided to have, on Passover in April, a priestly blessing in the women's section. The media went crazy. The ultra-Orthodox went crazy. Rabbi Rabinovich went to the police. The police phoned Anat Hoffman and me and said, you cannot hold a priestly blessing in the women's section. If you try, we will stop you. We won't even let you come in. We'll stop you from even coming into the Western Wall. So we had to promise them that we would not hold the priestly blessing that day. But we are bringing it in 
at our Rosh Chodesh prayers, we, because it's part of the prayer, but we, we're kind of widening it. It's not only the priest, the descendants of the Kohanim who are blessing the rest, or the Kohan not in our case, but it's also mothers are blessing their daughters and sisters are blessing each other. We, we feel that this is a way to give a blessing to everybody, to everybody who's come to pray with us. And so um, we have these brooches that you can come and pick up outside. And this is something that we feel is one of those rituals that many women want to claim. They, wa they want to be part of it. It's part of the way they are worshipping. Another thing that's happening, uh, over Hanukkah, in the men's section, there is a huge Hanukkiah, huge menorah. When I say huge, it's much larger than I am. And the first day, the second day, the third day, every day, different men, because it's in the men's section, come to light the, the, the Hanukkiah, the prime minister, if it's a man, and the, 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 the president of the Supreme Court, if he's a man, and politicians only if they're men. So this is, of course, unacceptable to us. So we demanded that either this menorah be put at the back, at the main plaza where men and women can light it and bless and say the, the, the blessing, or we want the same kind of menorah in the women's section. And then we would invite women that we feel are leaders and we value and, and uh, you know, to come and, and give them the, the kavod, the, you know, to light the, um, the, the Hanukkiah. And two guesses what Rabbi Rabinovich said. <laughs> he said, no, this was two years ago. And so we came in with about 30 little uh, Hanukkiot and we lit them. It was very beautiful. And uh, one of our board members is uh, Susan Silverman, Rabbi Susan Silverman, the sister of Sarah Silverman, who was in Israel at that time. And so she was with us and it, of course, she tweeted and it was, we, we got a lot of attention that time. And so last year, again, we wrote to Rabbi Rabinovich and we, we wrote to the Prime Minister and we demanded to have our Hanukkiah in the women's section. And Rabbi Rabinovich said, no. And so uh, a few days before Hanukkah, I managed to buy a second-hand uh, Hanukkiah about this high, uh, light enough for us to carry. And we had a member of Knesset with us, a very, very interesting woman called Ksania Svetlova. She is uh, f from the former Soviet Union, uh, speaks uh, Russian, Arabic, English, Hebrew, wonderful woman, a feminist, and she joined us. And because the guards are not permitted to touch her, because she is a member of Knesset, she has uh, immunity, so, um, she held it, and we pushed, we all pushed, and we got the menorah in, the Hanukkiah in, and we lit it, and we were very excited about it. And this year, we're going to do it again. We're going, we're going to write, we're writing our letters, we're trying to get uh, permission to, to have a Hanukkiah in, in the women's section. So these are still things that we know we have to achieve. And we also know that as long as we are there, we are the spearhead. We are there and we will not give up and we are not afraid. And, and we will, you know, things will move. And we know that North American Jewry is behind us. You know, I, I always say that, that um, the, I'll, I'll say it in, in another way, the uh, deputy, um, uh, the number two man who was at the, on the panel with me of the um, embassy, uh, of the, the deputy council to Florida, said something uh, like, uh, um, I promise you, this ship has sailed and you just need to give it more time. So I say that the people here are the wind in our sails of that ship that has already sailed. Because we couldn't do it without the support that we get. Because Netanyahu doesn't care about women of the war. He doesn't care. We're not his, most of us aren't the people who elect him probably. It, he doesn't care about us, but he does care about all of you and what you think, and what you say, and the letters that you write, 
And we have campaigns. And, you know, I want to urge you to go on our Facebook and, and to, to have a look at our site and to write the letters when we have them and to send them because it does have an influence. Anything that happens here influences what, what goes on there. And making Israel into a country which has more religious tolerance and pluralism and gender equality, that's good for all of us. Because a democratic Israel that, that has respect to the rights of all of us is, is something that, that we all need. It strengthens the country, it strengthens the Jewish people. It, it's something so important. And we are, all of us, partners in, the, in this battle to change um, this, these very vital, important aspects of democratic Israel. So I'm going to end up now and open it up to questions and answers. And uh, thank you in the meantime, but please, any questions? I think there's a lot of there are a lot of lessons to be learnt from women of the wall for, uh, on other subjects. Now, women of the wall is only on the subject of the wall and religious pluralism and women's rights. But um, again, I, I, I'm not sure that North. Well, firstly, you see, uh, what I was talking about now is that many of the leaders, for the first time, are saying, "We love Israel, but." You've got to accept us. As, uh, stop treating us this way. So this is the first time that this is happening. And, and what happened last night, I think, shook, really, really shook Netanyahu to the core because he had the leaders, you know, Steve Warnick and, and Rick Jacobs, and really the leaders who, who come to the Board of Governors of the Jewish Agency, these are the, the, the strongest Zionists, the biggest lovers of Israel, coming and saying, against your request, we are going to walk up with the Torah scrolls, because he asked them not to. Of course he asked them not to. And they said, no, this time we're not giving in. So, you know, we might be seeing some kind of uh, shift. I think that you have more strength than, than, you, can, than you imagine here, your, your voices, your actions. Um, I have a story to, just to demonstrate it. So um, one day, uh, my, my chairperson, and us, uh, Hoffman, and I get a phone call um, from the police station in the old city. There's a new police chief, and he wants to meet us. His name is Avi Biton. He wants to meet us, and Anat and I look at each other, and we say, okay, we have to go there and wait, and he's probably one of these macho police officers that we're used to dealing with. And we said, okay. And she said, when is it convenient that he comes to your office? And we said, well, any time, just come, you know. So he arrived with his entourage, uh, his legal advisor, and his spokesperson, and, and several other officers who arrested me many times. Um, and they sit in our office for the first time ever. And he says, tell me about women of the wall. We look at him, and of course we tell him the history and how it happened, and, and, and when he, he asks questions, and then I say, can I ask him you a question? And he said, yes, and I say, I want to meet your mother. Tell me about your mother. <laughs> you know, I want to know. He said, no. He said, 
I was taken to the United States by, uh, uh, with, with, a, with a group of other police officers, and we sat in uh, with the Federation. We met with Americans and we sat in a, in a dinner with the Federation in Atlanta. And at my table, they said, uh, so what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm getting, coming back to Israel, and I'm starting a new job. I'm going to be in charge of the old city and the Western Wall. She was attacked by all the people at the table. They said, what's this with women of the wall? And suddenly, the whole room was only talking about that. And he said, I understand what is important to Jews in North America, and I promise you, I will not arrest you. And, and I said, okay, give me your cellular phone number. <laughs> And I used it, I used it many times, one time in the middle of the night. Anyway, so what, what I'm trying to say is that, that I think that you have the ability to influence um, Israel more than, than you realize, and especially nowadays with social media. And, you know, people have to use it in the way that they believe is the right way. So. I, I think it's easier today than ever before to, to be able to make your voice heard um, and, and join other organizations that think like you and become active in them and bring change in the way that you want. Ideas? Smuggling in a Torah scroll? Anything? <laughs> it's, the, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. Yeah? Um, how did you well, we did, we did it several ways. So right at the beginning, I suddenly saw that that seven-foot partition between the men and the women's section, the cleaner would open a latch, go to the other side, clean, open the latch, and come back to this side. I said, okay, if he can open the latch, anyone can open that latch. You know, it's easy. So we got a group of men praying on the men's side, and at a certain point, they opened the latch and they passed the Torah scroll to us. The month after that, oh, it was, it was, there was a riot there. I mean, it was, the month after that, we arrived, there are padlocks like this on the, and they, they, they put up a fence with a no man's land, you know, between, between the, 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 the seven meter partition and the men. So we had two groups of men. One was supposed to be a decoy, and the other one was supposed to pass the Torah scroll. It didn't succeed. Another time, I came the night beforehand. I sat there the whole night. I brought it in in a baby carriage. Then, at 3.45 in the morning, a policeman comes up to me. It was during the, the high holidays, so there are a lot of people all night. 3.35, there was about an hour where there were less people. A policeman comes up to me, probably realized I was up to no good, and he says, I need to see what's in your bag. Ma'am, I need to see what's in your bag, you know, like they do in the airport for me. Ma'am, open your bag. So I, open, I say to him, I have a Torah scroll in my bag. And he said, you're going to have to come with me. And I said, actually, no, I don't have to come with you because I'm within the law. If it's here, I can read it. I can hold it. He said, you have to come to the police station to discuss this with me. I said, I'm not going out because if I go out, I can't come in again. No way. I'm not saying there's a girl who has a bat mitzvah tomorrow, and I want her to have the Torah scroll to have a bat mitzvah. We have a lot of girls having bat mitzvahs uh, with us. It's, it's really wonderful. So he said, uh, you have to come with me. I don't have to come with you. And I said to him, listen, I'm going to have to call Avi Beaton. Remember, I have a cellular phone number. He said to me, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. He said, I don't believe you. So I called Avi Beaton, 3.45 in the morning. He's on vacation with his wife. He's not very happy. And I say to him, I'm here in the women's section with the Torah scroll, and I've got other women with me with their cellular phones, and they have the ability to take videos on their cellular phones. You know that. And I'm not going quietly this time. And the next thing I know, the policeman comes up to me and says, okay, you know, give me your ID, you can stay here. And we had a Torah scroll the next day for the bat mitzvah, which was very exciting. Um, we tried to bring it in the, uh, um, just recently in a bag with a double bottom. Unfortunately, we didn't succeed. We've had men try to bring it in uh, a false bottom. Uh, we've had men who've tried to bring it in and sometimes have succeeded and have it on, on their bodies under a jacket. But um, it's getting harder and harder. But more than that, you know, that's amusing. But it shouldn't be that way. 
that is the main thing. It shouldn't be that way. They should let us bring in a Torah scroll, pray freely, the way the court ruled that we can, and at the same time, you know, uh, um, go through with the agreement, with, with vote at the, at, the, at the parliament. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you, and this is very important, um, on the 6th of, uh, of October, just before I left, um, the Reform Movement, Conservative Movement, Women of the Wall, and two other organizations uh, put in an appeal to the Supreme Court of Israel demanding one of two things. Either you divide the northern plaza, men and women, into men, egalitarian and women, which will never happen, but either you do that, we want the court to rule that either the northern plaza be divided into three and give us representation on the Kotel Heritage Foundation that runs it, or build the southern plaza according to the agreement. And the fact that it is going to be discussed in the Supreme Court is more pressure on Netanyahu and on the government of Israel. So things are going to happen. We are going to continue being there every beginning of the month with the Quran not blessing, bringing in a Torah scroll, whatever is necessary, and we're going to be fighting in the courts and the North American leaders of our movement, together with the Israeli leaders, are going to continue the pressure on Netanyahu and through the embassies and write letter writing and all that, and at the end, we will succeed because this is a battle that we can't afford to lose because if we lose it, we lose on so many fronts in Israel, from marriage and divorce to burial to conversion to so many other areas where we, both women, are fighting for recognition, for equal rights, and the liberal movement are fighting for recognition and equal rights. So we can't afford to, to lose this battle, and, and we don't intend to lose it either. They said that if that they would pull out. The fact that they said it doesn't mean that they're going to do it. And Netanyahu is very smart. If he really wants this to happen, he will make it happen. So, He's, so you think they're bluffing? And if they're not, wouldn't that be bad for everyone? I think they bluffed. When they, when they started off, they bluffed. Netanyahu could have called their bluff easily. Um, but he has his own interests. Um, and um, you know what? If they pull out, there'll be elections. And maybe you'll be happier. <laughs> you know? It's not the end of the world. We have elections. Well, we can have them again. So it's not, not a problem. And there are enough people in Israel that don't want to see ultra-orthodoxy ultra, 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 ruling uh, all our lives. So um, I, I think you're talking about a specific point, which, which is I'll, I'll, I'll discuss here. Um, when we decided to go into negotiations with the government, there were several women who disagreed. They felt that we should never move from the women's section. We should stay there always, that the battle is for the women's section, and we shouldn't be part of a battle for an egalitarian uh, section or for any other part of the Western Wall. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an, a non-profit non organization, and we have a board, and the board, except for one, voted to go ahead with the, the negotiations. We felt that the government of Israel, when the government of Israel says, come, let's sit and talk, 
you go and you sit and you talk, especially since it's the first time ever that they were want, invited us to sit and talk to them and didn't tell us what they want us to do. So we felt that we also believed, and, and we, we had legal advisors uh, say to us, that um, what could happen if we didn't go to the negotiating table is that they would do some cosmetic changes in the southern part of the Western Wall, and then the courts would send us there. Because remember, the courts said that we don't have to pray there because we're, we're, uh, it's not prepared. It, it's not a, it doesn't feel like a, a, a place that we would want to pray. And we also believe that the coalition with the Reform and Conservative Movement and the federations would, would be much stronger, and we were, we were correct. And, and we, we believe that we could bring tremendous change, which is much larger than our original goal, which was to pray in the women's section. I mean, the empowerment and the change and everything that's happening, we're already, that's already happening. So, um, you know, some women decided to leave us and continue fighting to pray in the women's section. Um, we love them, they are sisters, we think they're wrong, they think our, we are wrong. And, and that's okay, it happens a lot in, in, in non-governmental organizations that are very successful and manage to bring change. Many times um, groups, uh, they splinter groups and some leave, but at the moment, you know, we're all fighting for the same thing. Um, and when the time comes, you know, we'll have to see what, what, will, what they will decide to, to do. Um, it's sad that they, there's a disagreement, but uh, we are um, a, a feminist organization and um, we embrace them. But I, I presume that that's what you were talking about. One of the things that we did is, is w while the board was making the decision, we talked to many, many women in different circles. Each one of the board members took upon herself to speak to groups abroad and other organizations, and we tried to explain to them um, why we were taking this, this step and what the, what the, what the rationale was and, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just part of uh, managing an organization uh, that you try and and, and in, you know, bring in as many uh, people, as many women in our case, to the, to the conversation and to the circles. But at the end of the day, it's the board of the organization that has to make the decisions because they are also responsible legally for anything that happens in the, in the organization. And they are the body that makes the, the, the final decisions. Um, so that's the only way to, uh, to handle it, I would say. Again, in Israel, the, because there's no separation between uh, church and state, you know, politics and, uh, and religion, I would say it that way, P politics and, and, uh, and religion, uh, it makes it much harder because the Judaism in Israel that is prevailing and that, that everybody aligns up to is orthodoxy. So it makes it so hard. Um, and one of the things that we say all the time, I'm talking now as, as a liberal Jew, is that there's more than one way of being Jewish. And if they would only accept that, everything would be good. The thing is that 
it's, it's not the liberal Jews that won't accept orthodoxy or ultra-orthodoxy. It's the other way around. So when, when you, you have a problem with it, it's you as those who are willing to accept and include and, and, and believe that there are more than one way to, to worship. And so the problem is not with you. It's with whoever will not accept or, or validate or, or you know, agree that, they're, that your way of practicing is legitimate. And, uh, and I, I think that, that either you have to say, okay, you don't accept us. You think that we're not Jewish enough, that we're not true Judaism, that you know, there's something wrong with the way we worship. Um, goodbye, tough luck. You do your thing, we'll do our thing. I, I don't think that you can... You, th there's just that amount of bending that you're, you can do to, to, to people who, who don't accept you in, in, or don't think that, that the way you, your worship is, is legitimate. And, um, and, and you can't say no. You, it's, it's okay to say, excuse me, let's separate forces. You, you do your thing and we'll do our thing. And, and when we can work together, we'll work together. And when we can't, we won't. Um, I don't know if that answers you, but th th that's, the way, that's the way I see it. And uh, we're always happy to uh, cooperate with anyone who's willing to accept us, to say, okay, it's legitimate uh, the way you're doing. It's very interesting. There's a, a, an Orthodox uh, group in Israel um, called Ne'emanei Torah Ve'avodah. I wouldn't know how to translate that, um, but they're, they're very well um, known and, 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 and appreciated, and they are orthodox, they're not conservative. And they came out just a, a week ago um, with uh, saying that as far as they're concerned, reform and, that, that reform and conservative, uh, conservative Judaism should have a, worship, a place to worship at the Kotel. It was a real bomb in Israel that they, they, they said that. And, and so those, those, that group is a group that we can say, okay, this is a group that we can sit and talk to and compromise with and work with. And, but, but they need to, to acknowledge our legitimacy as well. That's an idea. I, I will no, definitely no, work no, with no, that. No, that no, is an no, idea. And, and take it in. Um, I, I'm not sure that it, it would work because the policemen there all know each other. So, but, but, but it's certainly an, an idea that I haven't never thought about. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not sure that that the members of Knesset. I, I'm not sure that the members of Knesset would bring in a scroll because there is that regulation of Rabbi Rabinovich. So I'm not. I'm not. You know, not sure they would agree. It, but but we might have to resort, resort to that. That might be a possibility. Um, so so again, we, we have to differentiate between orthodox and ultra orthodox. So women of the wall have orthodox women with us. Um, many of the ultra-orthodox women, you know, have no problem with us praying there. They do their thing. We try not to stand too close to the wall. We're very respective uh, of, of their 
needs and wishes and we stand kind of further away, we always have, towards the back of the women's section. Um, and so many of them have no problem and sometimes I look at young women who come in and they look at us. Now, they recognize the words, the prayer, the, I mean, it's what they do. And they look at us and I, I say, what if they have that subversive thought, why not? That, that, that would be wonderful. Um, but um, they don't come and support us. Some other women who come along sometimes join us. They're, I don't know, they're there for some other, but they're not all for Orthodox. I did once, after one of my arrests, get a phone call from a woman, um, and she said, am I speaking to Leslie? I said, yes. And she said, uh, um, I was there, I'm an all for Orthodox woman. And she told me what group she belongs to. They are very, very all for Orthodox. And she said, I want you to know that I am ashamed at the way you are treated there. It is shameful. I don't agree with it, and I just want you to know about it. And so this woman and I started talking, and she phoned me several times, and you know, we, we talked quite a lot. Um, but that is the, an exception to the rule. Most of them are not supportive of us. It's also, you know, um, I call it, you know, it's like the Stockholm syn syndrome. You know, they believe that it's wrong that their men should hear our voices. They, they, they really believe it. Not to talk about the fact that we're reading from the Torah, we're desecrating it, I don't know what. They, they truly believe it. And that's why I think we should leave the women's section. And that, that's, that's an answer to you. Because as a feminist and a pluralist, if I have an alternative, I want to let them pray the way they want to pray. I think that they deserve it. If I have an alternative that's good for me. Yes? So, so thank you for that question, and there are a few, a few answers. So firstly, uh, the army used to hold ceremonies, not in the men's section or the women's section, but in the back, you know, in the plaza, used to have a cer ceremonies of swearing in soldiers. But then they decided that they didn't want to hear women's voices, um, not singing really Hatikva, and certainly not commanders. There are more and more women commanders nowadays because the army opened up over the last few years, um, swearing with, with a, a loudspeaker, you know, with sound system, uh, swearing in their soldiers. So um, uh, women are certainly discriminated against, and the army is holding less ceremonies there than it used to. There's another story, not with the army, but also interesting, uh, because I talked to you about how the Western Wall has become more and more um, ultra-Orthodox. Um, the Jewish agency, when the, the first, uh, you know, when immigrants were coming from the former Soviet Union, they would bring a, a plane load directly to the Western Wall, and they were, would sit at the back there in plastic chairs and get their IDs. They were waiting for them. And then the rabbi, Rabbi Novich, lifetime appointment, demanded that men and women sit separately at the back. There's no separation, no segregation there. And the Jewish agency said, thank you very much, no more, and they, they don't go there. But an interesting thing, um, if I, I don't know how much time I have, if I have a, another moment, an interesting thing is happening in the army. Um, because um, we fought for many years, um, as you heard, I was in the Israel Women's Network, and we fought to open up the army, all positions in the army to women. Because the Israeli army is a stepping stone in politics, it is the, those years where young women and men form their idea of how society can look, what their aspirations can be, about you know, how the pyramid looks, whether there is a pyramid, glass ceiling, and so on and so forth. We felt it was very important to open the, the military. There was this young woman called Alice Miller who wanted to be a pilot, and they wouldn't even 
test her, let her go through the examination. Supreme Court, Supreme Court said, Israeli army has to be open to, to uh, you know, it should be gender neutral, open, equality. And so nearly all the positions are open. So there are more and more women who are commanders of even fighters, but instructors in every area possible. My niece was a tank in instructor. But what's happening now is that religion is going, becoming more and more strong within the army because um, there is a demand that ultra-Orthodox serve in the army. Because like everybody else, so there's special units. Not only are there special units, but the, 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 there's, there's kind of a pendulum of fundamentalism to an extent. And the army is becoming more and more, all I can say is, is religious. And certain soldiers, they don't want women to sing, women soldiers to sing, uh, if, you know, entertainers to come. They don't want women soldiers. And, and so here we have a situation that on the one hand, we fought to open the army. And on the other hand, the, the battle to get the ultra-Orthodox to serve in the army, just like our guys and so on, is, is, is a backlash. You know, we're, we're having a problem. So that has nothing to do with women of the war, but it's just a kind of a taste of that tremendous tension we have between um, state and religion and religious and religion and po politics and, and so on, that we have to try and, 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 and somehow uh, deal with it, unravel it, um, to make sure that our achievements um, won't be damaged by um, the, the army becoming more, more religious. Thank you very much for coming. You can come to the table outside and uh, pick up the priestly blessings.